Hello, party people, and welcome to the Akihabara area of, and I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that, of Tokyo. For decades, this was like the electronics place to go, as in like computer parts, electronic parts, uh, uh, anime supplies, cosplay supplies, pachinko, maid cafes. Um, these days, it's much more tourist-oriented. This will probably be the loudest office hours I've ever done. There's a giant TV screen up above. There's traffic going by back behind. We'll see how the noise cleanup goes today. So let's go through your top voted questions from PollGab. The top voted question from Very Lost says, do I need to do something special to get your six month DBA training plan? I keep signing up for it, but I've never gotten one of the emails. Well, of course, without your email address, there's really nothing I can do about that. Your best bet anytime you have like customer support related stuff is to go to brentozar.com and click contact at the top of the site. That way I can get to your customer support issues. Both me and my team can do it. You don't have to wait for PollGab for that. So there you go. Next up, my tea got cold asks, is it sensible to use query hints to stagger or test a migration uh, from one compatibility level to another. It seems like a good idea, but I've never heard anyone do it. No, not really, because you would have to hint all of the queries in your application. That doesn't really make any sense. What you can do is, when you stay on an older compatibility level, but when you find queries that perform better at a newer one or with different cardinality estimation hints, just hint those queries forward. So that way you're only opting into the new experience where it actually makes sense for you from a performance perspective. Next up, this one's a little weird. Curious DBA says, for a column with a two column primary key and queries filtering in lists on both columns, SQL Server's doing a clustered index seek on only the first column, then a filtering operation on the second column afterwards. He continues, is SQL capable of determining when a union would be better for a query instead? I read that whole entire question out because by now most of you are like, wait, what the... A train leaves Philadelphia and a jogger goes into his kitchen to get orange juice. When you're asking a question, try to filter it down to the simplest possible part of the question. Don't put any extra stuff in. Think of it as every word costs you money because it really costs you attention span on the other person who's having to answer the question. In this case, let's just go with the last several words of your question. Is SQL capable of determining when union would be better for a query instead? Maybe. It depends on how complex your query is. The more complex it is, the less time the SQL Server has to really consider. Now, that, that's, that generalization is a little tricky. SQL Server will take more time to try and build a better plan. But if you're gambling on SQL Server to rewrite your query for you in the most performant way, you're going to be in a, for a rough time through the rest of your career. It sounds like it's time where you know a better way to rewrite the query. You should do that. That's what query tuning is all about. Uh, next up, Anonymous DBA asks, uh, hold on a second here, for Anonymous, oh, I might have clicked on the wrong button. I might have spammed it. Oh, I did. Hold on a second. I put it into the spam pile, and let me go refresh that. Anonymous DBA says, we have a heap table with more than 15 indexes, no updates, only selects and inserts. It shows up at the top of the list with the highest number of indexes fragmented. Timeout, and I know this is frustrating for folks who watch Office Hours a lot. Whenever you have a fragmentation question, search for Brent Ozar fragmentation. And I have whole videos and blog posts explaining why fragmentation probably isn't something that you should be worried about in the year 2025. There are edge cases where you are, but it's a really rare edge case. It's not something that's super common. Next up, Summer Fondness says, Hi Brent, if I had a friend, they might have asked, I love what you did there, 
Do you think this is the right time to take a risk and learn a database outside the norm, like Iceberg, that my friend thinks that there, something like Iceberg has big benefits in industries that make big money, and they might want to get closer to that big money? So that's less about a question of industry timing. It's more of a question about your timing. When is it right for you to gamble on your career? There are really kind of two phases in your career, and you'll go back and forth between these two phases all the time. Well, not, not too often, it takes a year or two. Times when you can afford to invest in yourself and learn new technologies that won't pay the bill for a while, and time when, it's, uh, when you want to be taking money off the table to be safe uh, and pay for things. This can also happen around like family emergencies or health issues, having kids. Um, there are different phases of your career where it makes more sense to invest versus take money off the table. That's something that only you can answer. Or if, if you sit down with a mentor and think about, you know, how much money do you need to put away right now? How much are you making? What is your tolerance for risk? What is your partner's tolerance for risk? Things like that. Uh, next up, Tom asks, do you have a process for creating your own hands-on projects when you're learning new technologies like Postgres? It's always a catch-22 at work when we're wanting to take on new projects, but we need the hands-on experience. So instead of creating experiments, go to your users and stakeholders ask them what problems they need solved, what are issues with the data, what are issues with the reporting, the processing, what are issues with the business that you need solved. That dictates the process. That also dictates what tools you learn to as well. Next up, MidDBA says, I, Hi Brent, I have a non-clustered index on a table that has a billion reads and 1.3 million writes. Do you think that's a problem? Do you think that's a problem? Why do you think that's a problem? I have a tibula bone that's 18 inches long. Do you think that's a problem? I like broccoli. I also like cheddar cheese. Do you think that... Who gives a damn? What's the problem that you're trying to solve? Instead of just standing around looking at metrics, what's the problem that you're trying to solve? Focus on that instead. Stefan asks something completely different. Stefan says, after 11 years as an underpaid and overworked database administrator, I'm leaving the company to do something completely different. I want to thank you for everything you've done for the community and a big heart to this very lovely and helpful community as well. I'll miss y'all. Well, Stefan, the one thing that I will warn you about is that you misspelled the word underpaid. You said under P-A-Y-E-D. So just be careful when you think you're underpaid, but I'm glad we could help. Uh, next up, Dopinder says, I'm trying to convince uh, the developers not to send customer-facing emails from SQL Server stored procedures. What are your top supporting reasons for this? Dopinder, you're in luck. If you go to brentozar.com slash blog, in the last two, three weeks, I actually published a blog post about this. Probably happened like right after, right before you posted your question somewhere in there. So go to brentozar.com slash blog and go check out, uh, just page down until you find the post about what, how to use SQL Server to send uh, customer facing emails. Mark Simon asks, hi Brent, does your training cover how to use Query Store? It does not only because I don't do it. It's not that it's not cool, it's just that I have this really weird job where customers hire me to fix emergency problems, I have a limited amount of time to do it, and I usually can't add anything new into the environment like Query Store. So I don't teach it because I don't do it. Your best bet really is to go to YouTube and search for Query Store Aaron, E-R-I-N, Stellato, S-T-E-L-L-A-T-O, and she has a bunch of great videos out there on how to do it. They're all completely free. Go check those out. 
I, I know several trainers in the SQL Server business who simply don't write any query store material because Aaron's stuff is all good. It's out there for free. You should just go grab the free stuff. Um, it's free because she works for Microsoft now. She works for Microsoft doing uh, SQL Server Management Studio, Azure Data Studio, things like that. Uh, so she doesn't do training anymore, so she just gives that stuff away for free. Next up, Crooked DBA asks, every now and then my CPU elevates and I see queries locking on one page in TempDB. Once it starts, the CPU stays elevated until I clear the plan cache. Can a bad plan flag as a TempDB uh, wait on a specific page? Absolutely it can. So what you want to do is look at the query plans that are blocking on that page and go fix them. Odds are the techniques that you're going to use in order to go fix them are covered in my Fundamentals of TempDB class. But I bet, really, if you just look at the query plans that are involved in those queries, you might have enough information in there on how to make them go faster just by yourself with no training. Might be a matter of needing an index or changing the way that you're creating temp tables like crazy. It'll probably jump right out to you there. But if not, I'm here for you. And then uh, last up, we'll do one more. Pro says, I've come across some tricky behavior, and he adds a bunch of select stuff inside the, the thing. He says, the reason for this is clear, but what would be the best way to compare row versions? This is another great example of how obfuscating your question makes things less likely for you to get a good answer. I drive a red Honda Chevy. Uh, looking at buying a used Ferrari Lamborghini, what's the best shirt to wear at work? Keep it simple. You know how the rest of that saying goes. Keep it simple. Boil your question down as clearly as possible and stop trying to throw fakes when you're writing the question out. If you find yourself trying to communicate multiple points, break that into separate questions. And that's just plain good life advice. Uh, your last part of it was, what's the best way to compare row versions? I simply don't know, because I just don't do it, and I don't know the rest of the garbage in your, uh, the rest of the interesting things inside your question either. And I've got a bunch of select queries that I'm not about to go run them here in Tokyo. And come on, you know how office hours works. I don't do demos on office hours. I don't open up management studio. This is something that I do just for fun to help y'all out and give you some fun ways to go see interesting scenery and see different answers to different people's questions, but be realistic here. All right, so it's time for me to go wander around Akihabara. It is Akihabara. It is a little bit early here. It's about 9.30 a.m. The stores here don't open till 10. And uh, the stores, I was here yesterday wandering around. Eve and I Eve was determined to go to a maid cafe. And I was like, all right, sure, let's do it. So went to a maid cafe. That was extremely awkward. That was hilariously awkward. Uh, and, but I had a good time. And uh, wandered around here with all kinds of shopping. I did not understand the meaning of the term otaku until I came here. Those of you who are into anime and mango will know what that is. and, and uh, It's not like a porn term or anything like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can Google it and it's totally okay. Uh, but I did not realize the extent of it until I came here. There are serious, serious fans of specific anime, specific queer uh, characters, manga, and so forth. And I wandered through one store after another that was just filled with figurines, characters, uh, acrylic stands, stickers, t-shirts. Um, so it's absolutely incredible, overwhelming, giant. I don't watch any specific anime. I really just came through here to go see what this was like, and it was actually really cool. Um, so I'm going to go back to uh, the one that I happen to see is right across here. Let me turn this around. Uh, G Store. I don't know if I can zoom in with that or not. Um, but G-Store was a really cool cosplay, t-shirts, uh, stickers kind of store, a bunch of figurines. So I'm going back in there today to, uh, and then probably also some of these stores over here as well.
uh, this finishes up my Japan trip. Uh, uh, we in, uh, were here for Christmas Eve dinner, Christmas, and then we fly back home the day after Christmas, which is funny because, you know, most people will spend the holidays with their family. I'm going up to see my family after the holidays, uh, but uh, back in the U.S. for quite a while. Then the next trip we have scheduled is we're going to go spend three weeks in Iceland in uh, second half of February and early March. So there'll be a lot of fun videos out of that as well. Although, because it's going to be the winter in Iceland, it's going to be a lot of snow uh, and a lot of white views over there, glaciers, that kind of thing. So I hope you had fun and learned something, and I will see you all on the next Office Hours. Adios.